Well, I'm going to have you turn to Isaiah within the Old Testament, uh, Isaiah 52. And I appreciate whoever brought the chair up for me here. I'm just going to use uh, this again today, and, and maybe next week I'll, I'll get to that. It's a little bit low for me there, and I want to be able to see Donna because she's hiding over here in the corner, and if I'm there, I can't see her over there. Well, deserts are among the ecosystems that receive fewer than 10 inches of rain uh, or precipitation a year. You can find them on every continent, and they cover about a fifth of the planet's landmass. The one thing that all deserts actually have in common is that they are arid and they are dry. Uh, although the word desert can bring to mind uh, the, the mental image of Aladdin or shifting sands, uh, sand dunes actually only cover about 10% of deserts. Most deserts are, are mountainous areas. They have dry expanses of rock or sand or, or even salt flats like we see in the western part of our country. When I think about deserts, I think about places like Death Valley, and I don't know if any of you have ever been into that area, but Death Valley, California receives less than two inches of rainfall every year. It is an arid landscape that is impacted by infrequent rain and extreme temperatures, and it has mysteries, like these rocks and boulders that seem much too large for wind to push around, but they have trails as though they have been moving alive. Uh, like pet rocks from the 70s that came to life, like Homo Sasquatches in the Appalachias. You remember pet rocks, anybody? Yeah, Christmas of 1975, I hate to say it, I was eight years of age, when ad exec Gary Dahl picked up some smooth stones from the sands of Baja, California, Mexico, and he, he marketed them as live pets. They came in custom cardboard boxes complete with straw and breathing holes cut into the side of the box. And I thought about that and wondered who in the world would ever buy something like a pet rock? We did. <laughs> Within two months, Doll was setting 10,000 sales a day. And for Christmas in 1975, he sold an estimated 1.3 to 1.5 million rocks, and he became a self-made millionaire. In fact, if you've ever seen those books for dummies quote, in 2007, he wrote the book, Advertising for Dummies. Now, folks, it, I just want to say this. If you have ever painted lines on the field for upward soccer like Jim Miller, if you have ever planted flowers around this church or planted trees, if you ever had to dig a hole around this church, you know how rocky the ground is around this church. So let me just say, folks, we are sitting on a gold mine. But Dahl confirmed one thing for me. A lot of crazy things can come out of the desert. Let me ask you this morning, what are some adjectives you would use to describe a desert? Dry? Hot? Cold? Ah, yeah. Good. Yeah, dry, hot, cold. How about empty? You know, th those are all good words, but they don't tell the whole story because even though some deserts are hot, like you said, some deserts are quite cold. Some have cold winters and are cold year-round. Uh, some can reach degrees as high as 130 degrees. Some can go very, very low. But my question in bringing all that is this. Out of all the different landscapes on this planet, why would God choose to bring life out of the desert. Out of all the different places on this earth, why would a wonderful creator God raise up Father Abraham and a nation of Jewish people? Why would he ever establish Israel or prepare his son's border entry to earth from heaven in such an inhospitable desert region of the world such as Egypt, as the Middle East, and ultimately in Palestine? Why not choose Venice, right? Why not choose the Amalfi Coast, Italia? It's beautiful there. Or Santorini, Greece. Why not choose Cape Town, South Africa, or closer to home? You know, I mean, come on, God. Why didn't you choose a place like Yellowstone and, and Wyoming? Anywhere along the Blue Ridge Parkway that I grew up along in Virginia and North Carolina. Or, or Savannah, Georgia, 
in its, its beautiful estates. God, why not bring your son to this world in Kauai, Hawaii, or Old Man's Cave, right, in Hocking Hills in the beautiful part of Ohio? Well, I think God, honestly, chose to deliver his son into this world to be in the desert, in the scene of his greatest work, because as in all things, God's work is best seen in contrast. Because our God is a from nothing kind of God. By voice, by his presence, he brings life from in every appearance what we would expect to be death. And when you can't th when you think this life when you think your world cannot get any more arid or dry or desert-like, friends, you've got a God that brings water from the rock. <laughs> like the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 48, 21, they, God's people, they did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He made water flow for them from a rock. He split the rock and water gushed out. Earlier, he spoke of a future righteous kingdom in Isaiah 32, verses 1 and 2, when he said the king will reign in righteousness like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm, like streams of water in the desert and the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. Those are the words from which the, the lyrics of the song, beneath the cross of Jesus, were taken. So what is this excursion? into National Geographic images and, and deserts, and Isaiah's words have to do with our sermon series, Going, Going Great. What do they even have to do with our theme verse in 1 John 4.4? 4? Well, the scripture says what there? You, dear children, are from God, and you've overcome them, because greater is the one that is in you than the one that is where? In the world. And you and I both know how much like a desert how empty, how dry this existence, this world can be. And, and, and honestly, there are times I don't even choose to focus on the them of that verse. Who is, who is John referring to greater than they that are in the world? Well, they happen to be the false prophets, the deceivers whose messages have so anesthetized in, many in our world with the promises of rain, with the promises of saturation, and yet they are marked by the hardening attitudes and symptomatic empty promises of the Antichrist that is coming. According to 1 John 4, 5, it says they're from the world, and therefore they do nothing but speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world will listen to them. There, and, and our adaptation to disobedience, to downplaying sin, or to marginalizing truth in our culture today is why this world is in the state that is it in. And yet rather than leave us in a, in a desert, rather than leave us on planet earth in the universe's biggest litter box, God says this, my spirit of truth wants you to know me. And I want you to know my love for you and that I created you for so much more. I sent my son, Jesus in the flesh, from my side, to show you my desire. And my glory, he said, is that you recognize your birth from above. And you find your joy in the midst of and even beyond the desert. God wanted us to know that we have not been deserted, but as my sermon title suggests this morning, he wants us to have a, a desert ed. An education in the desert of guidance and wisdom. That title and your life, friends, are not typos. They are not mistakes. People in this world have adapted to living in the desert for thousands of years. Deserts are home to over a billion people on this earth, over one-sixth of Earth's population. And what I want you to catch today is, is that even though that is a lot of people... <laughs> Friends, in the minority, it is out of the least that God brings the greatest blessings. In fact, out of the eastern lands of Israel, the scripture that I want you to, to remember today, if you're going to memorize a verse this week, this is the verse I want you to memorize. Isaiah 52, verse 7. Isaiah 52, verse 7, where it says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring 
good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, and who say to Zion, your God reigns. What condition are your feet in today? You know, when I think of someone who came out of the desert, smelling like the desert, dressed for desert life, living on survivalist rations, I think of Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. And I think he represents a lot of that desert ed that, that God would have us recognize today. I think one of the things he reveals to us is that living by faith, it directs us beyond appearances to Christ for joyful anticipation. The longer we walk with Christ, the more we realize this world isn't everything. This world and what we see is not truly all the battle or all the life that is going on. And John was this forerunner who testified from the beginning that there is a spiritual joy that comes through obedience. There's a spiritual joy that comes as a promise from God. You know, Billy Sunday, the great old preacher, used to say this. He says, if you've got no joy... There's a leak in your Christianity somewhere. Friends, it's time to start looking for the leak. Joy permeates the entire existence of John the Baptist. According to the Old Testament, the arrival of the Messiah, the arrival of Jesus, would be bathed in a spiritual climate of joy. Nehemiah 8.10 is a verse that most of you will be familiar with. It was spoken some 2,450-ish years ago. When it said, the, the joy of the Lord is your strength. In other words, joy equals what? Strength. A lack of joy on the converse side of that equals what? Weakness. Mark it down. When you see a weakness within your life, when you see a church struggling with weakness, you see a lack of joy. When you see a lack of joy, you see a disconnectedness from the Holy Spirit that wants us to know joy. You see, joy is an arranged marriage. It's an arranged experience with God. He invites us into it regardless of the circumstances we work in, we live in, that we see every day. When Gabriel announced to John the Baptist's dad, Zechariah, that his wife was going to conceive, he said this, don't be afraid, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. And, and we're going to talk about prayer in a little bit. But he said, your wife Elizabeth is going to bear you a son and you're to call him John. And John's going to be a joy, he's going to be a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. And not only because you never have to worry about his lifestyle. You don't have to worry about him coming home drunk. You don't have to worry about him hanging out with the wrong people. The scripture says he's never to take wine or fermented drink. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. And Zechariah, when his son was born, he was so filled with joy, he just burst out, wrote a new hymn, wrote a new song. And he called him an expression of God's tenderness. I love that. When's the last time somebody looked at your life and said, you know what, that, that guy, that lady, she is an expression of God's tenderness to me because I can see the joy God has for me and everybody around them. And in this song, he announces this. Can I remind you, friends, this morning, there is one in this universe who does not want you to be joyful as a follower of Jesus. And the reason he does not want you to be joyful, and honestly, I'll tell you, it's not God. Francis de Sales wrote it this way, the evil one, he's pleased with sadness and melancholy. You know why? Because he himself is sad and melancholy, and he will be for all eternity. Hence, he wants everyone to be just like him. God wants his followers to be filled with joy. And when we're filled with joy, when we're filled with the spirit of righteousness, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we are filled with the life that is attractive, a life that blesses others, that invites others. It says of John in Matthew 3, verse 1, that in those days, Scripture, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness. Not every desert is shifting sand dunes, friends. He came from the wilderness of Judea saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It has come near. This is the one that was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, 
makes straight paths for him. And John's clothes, I love this, were made of camel's hair. He had a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. I am so glad we've got Texas Roadhouse. Uh, people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Friends, so much of life comes by the transformation of surrendering in that moment. How many of you remember Tamagotchis? Remember these little things? Pocket pets? You guys don't remember these? Oh, man. Uh, they were handheld digital pets. My girls had these when they were little. It was, it was my divine answer to two girls who would say, Dad, it followed me home. Can I keep it? Dogs, cats, squirrels, rabbits, pretty much anything, even almost a skunk at a campground. Dad, can we keep it? No, you cannot keep it. But you could buy them these little digital pets. And with these few little buttons, all you had to do was make sure you kept a schedule for it. You fed it, you watered it, you took it out, and it was so much easier to do that. And what I found were friends who did this for their kids, and while their kids went to school, they couldn't take it to school with them. And so adults were hooking these things on belt loops, and all day long they'd be feeding their digital pet for their kid because nobody wanted to tell their kid, Emma, I got some bad news for you. I forgot to feed your, your, your rabbit today, and it died. Here, here's your digital pet back. They had their own life cycle based on the care they received. Now, for many of us, we've got those things on our belt loops. They're called habits, hang-ups, and hurts, and they live as our pocket pals. And when we hold on to those things, when we hold on to our pocket pal of sins within our lives, and we refuse to leave them in the waters of baptism, we nurse, we care, we keep them alive, our joy goes down big time because sin always demands to be cared for. And the things that we thought would please us and keep us happy for a lifetime, over time we find they have a law of diminishing returns. What proudly produced celebration for us yesterday no longer does so today. And as the truth of Proverbs 30, 15 warns us, the leech has two daughters. Give, give more, they cry. John the Baptist, John 3.3, 3, he went into all the country around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. You see, what God wants for us in that moment is that new creation life. We all know as believers and followers of Christ, as the scriptures say, we live by faith and not by sight. Our spiritual heart knows the blessing of Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Why? Because he loved me, and he gave himself for me. And that kind of life, it cannot coexist with a lack of joy. Our Savior came not only as the way maker, as the song said, he came as the joy bringer. And when I think of a picture of, of pure joy, I think of little children. In fact, I think just recently, Cheryl and I took the two foster kids, and I can't show you their picture because that's a protection thing, but I think about the two foster kids we had a couple of weeks ago, and we took them to the splash pad down at Snyder Park, and some of you taking grandkids or kids there, and I cannot believe it is 1130 already, honestly, but, but, but let, me, let me do this with you. Give me just a few moments, if you would. We took them down to the splash pad, and the little girl was fascinated with this one little hole in the ground that spit water up on a cycle. And she would go over and stand at it until it squirted her in the face, and you would think she would cry, but she would laugh. She would stand over it until it squirted up her diaper, and she didn't have a swimming on, so that diaper ended up kind of down around her knees when it got all soaked. It, it, it would squirt in her mouth, and she would gag, and she had so much fun, she went back to that. You'd think she'd get bored with that. There's all kinds of other things she could play with. Nope. Spitting hole in the ground. I mean, honestly, I think that's why Europe invented the bidet, so people would be entertained. Anyway, the little boy that we had with him, he went to this one fountain that produced like a big bubble, and he would run under it, and he would just sit there. And he'd come out, and he'd go back under. And, and, and over an hour, he played with the same thing. And I thought, you know, the joy that we see in the happiest of a child is just a fraction 
of the joy that resides in the heart of our Heavenly Father. We don't have a God who, who started the creation of this world and said, you know what, I, I guess I better do something. I, be, I guess I better get to work. And he did halfway work through this universe and said, you know what, mosquitoes, bugs, dogs, cats, that'll do, it's good enough. He didn't create human beings partially and say, eh, it'll do. Because his heart was in everything. His creative ability was in everything. I, I love what G.K. Chesterton said. He said this. Now catch this. Because children have an abounding vitality, they are fierce in spirit and free. I thought about that phrase and thought, God, is that what you want for me? To be fierce in spirit and free? Because he says, God does things repeatedly and unchanging. As, as people, we always do things and something within our heart for a time says, do it again. And, and an adult will do something repetitively until they're dead almost from monotony. For grown-ups, the grown-up person does it again until they're nearly dead, he said. They're not strong enough to exult in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough to exult in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun. And every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that every daisy is alike. It may be possible that God puts one daisy on the planet and something within him in excitement says, do it again until the earth is covered with millions and millions of daisies separately. And he's never gotten tired of making them. It may be that God has the eternal appetite of infancy. For though we have sinned and grown old, ouch, our eternal father is younger than we are. We have sinned and grown old. But as the song said, Rich Mullins wrote, our father still waits and he watches down the road for his children to come and be made young. Friends, the problem, according to God, is not that we have too much happiness within our lives. The problem to God is we have too little joy in our life, in our fellowship. C.S. Lewis once said it very well, joy is the business of heaven. And joy is the mark of those who have learned to see life through the cross of Jesus Christ. Those who have seen the risen one who's passed through the cross, through the empty grave. The fruit of the resurrection says while they were still talking about this, Jesus stood among his disciples and he said to them, Shalom, peace be with you. And after that word he showed them his hands and his side. And the Bible says the disciples were filled with when they saw the Lord. Living by faith, friends, directs us beyond appearances in this world, in our culture, in the news, and even in our experiences and in, in our pain to Christ for joyful anticipation and expectation. For Christ is not only alive, he's in our midst, full of power and of love and, and of great and amazing grace for each one of us. You know, friends, I, I realize on our outlines there's a whole other point, and if you will let, allow me, I'm going to bring that to you next week to give you something to anticipate as well. But when we talk about a church that's going, going great or going, going gone, we talk about individuals that e either have or have not learned to take the business of joy seriously. If you are walking and keeping step with the Spirit, as the Apostle Paul would say, You've got joy. That doesn't mean life is going to be easy. It doesn't mean everything in, in, in life is going to be free of people that don't annoy you. In fact, John the Baptist is going to have a people come to him, and he's going to look at them, and he's going to honestly tell them straight as it is, you guys are a brood of vipers. <laughs> you guys are wanting nothing more than to strike my heel. But let me tell you, there's a guy that loves you too. Life is not easy, and it's not going to be easy, but... It can be transformed in perspective because this world is not all there is. And friends, maybe for you this morning, it's time to say yes to the joy giver. You've tried to find it in circumstances and people and relationships, in a job that you thought was going to be the perfect job, 
in a church fellowship you thought was going to be the perfect fellowship. Let me tell you something, friends. This side of heaven, there is no perfect church fellowship. We all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. But we're justified freely through the grace of Jesus Christ. So when we sing amazing grace, let's live by amazing grace. Let's accept the gift that God has. And maybe today is your time to say, my hands are empty, Bill. I've never accepted. I, I don't even think I know fully what grace is. I mean, I, I, I know you say that Jesus came to die for, for my sins, but do I have to list them all? How, how much time do you have? <laughs> Friends, it's not about the amount. It's about the effect of sin. The wages of sin is death, and the fact is, apart from Jesus Christ, we are dead men walking, dead women walking. It's, it's saying, God, I can't remember it all. I don't even know all the times I failed, but I know I have, and I know I need the forgiveness that you alone can give. So here's my life. Take it. Father, I want to change can't do it on my own. I need your Holy Spirit to guide me. I need your infilling spirit to lead me. I need, a, I need a Lord. I need a manager of this life. I need Jesus. Friends, if that's your desire, I want you to come as we sing this last song. Maybe you're looking for a church home and you're ready to say, you know, a church that proclaims the truth, that's what I need. A fellowship of the unashamed, that's what I need church that cares about the lost, that loves people because God loves them. That's what I need to be a part of. And I want you to put your membership with us today. I want you to encourage one another. And all the more as you see the return of our Lord fast approaching. I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning and, and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, when I say all that we are, I lay at your feet. Wow. That's good and bad and ugly. It's recognizing that every, every slap, every needle of a thorn that went through the scalp of your perfection, every verbal Use, every label, every name, every curse that has ever been uttered on this earth against you. You accept it because of me and all that I could never even begin to list. Father, I, I, I know grace is amazing because you choose to love me. You choose to look at all the things that, that we as a, as a people have done wrong and you say, no, no, I chose to go to Calvary. I chose to give my life. Something in our humanity cries, why? What is man that you would even consider us, God? But you did and you do and you will. Father, I pray for this church family and I pray for the witness of this church family because we want to be going, going great. We don't want to admit that there will be someone looking up from hell as, as the parable tells in the New Testament, saying, God, would you just send somebody here with a, a drop of water on their finger? I'm in agony. Or just send somebody to my family to warn them. When the fact is, you've, you've given the greatest testimony that they'll ever get. And we held on to it. Or we kept it to ourselves. Or we said, you know what, religion is a personal thing. But you didn't die for religion. You died for relationship. So, Father, use us to establish, to maintain, to encourage, to strengthen those relationships. Build into us a joy that overflows because our cup really is overflowing. We love you, Father, and we want to be faithful. So help us to make the decisions we need to make right now that will impact our and others' eternities. Jesus.